She's always nice to me. In preparation for today's sermon, the promise of the Father and the Holy Spirit, I, I was having some thoughts about how the Holy Spirit of God uh, has manifested Himself in my life and how He has been so beneficial. Lead, guide, direct, loving me, changing me from the inside out, being there for me from the very moment I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. And I thought about this, and, and I thought, boy, he's been good to me. He's led me out of a lot of places that could have caused me a lot of problems in life. And I listened to him, and he directed my paths in the right direction. And because of that, my life has been changed for better. It's been more exemplifying of Jesus than the flesh and myself. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Today's message is not a doctrinal message on the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. It's more of a practical message that I hope that you'll be able to take and apply to your life and have a, a little bit deeper understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how He is manifesting Himself in your life and, and how that you can count on Him, rely on Him, fellowship with Him, and know what He's doing in your life on a regular basis. So that's the purpose of this. So the promise, where did the promise start? It started with God. God who cannot lie, who never has broke a promise, promised in the book of Joel that there would come a day, and by the way, the book of Joel was written about 800 B.C. It was written by a prophet of Judah by the name of Joel, who wrote in a very turbulent time when the land was full of pestilence, full of locusts. The theme of Job is, of course, the day of the Lord. So Job, Job is actually writing about future events. It's a very prophetic book uh, that coincides with the Revelation as well. He's a minor prophet. He's got a lot to say. And God reveals to Job as what's going to happen in the program of Israel. And this is where it's so important to rightly divide the word of truth. Because if we don't realize that there's two programs in the Bible that all head in one direction, we can become very confused. You know, there's a program that God has for His children, Israel. It's clearly designed. And there's coming a day when you're going to see Joel fulfilled, where God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And then it says that young men will see visions, and old men will dream dreams. Have you ever thought about that statement? That's kind of the way it is. When we're younger, we have a lot of vision. You know, we see things in the future. But when we get old, we have a lot of dreams, don't we? We dream about the past, and we have a lot of wonderful war stories, and we like to think about how things were in our life and how God directed us and how God worked in situations, and we dream dreams. But young people are usually vibrant, full of vision, and maybe they're ready to go. I remember as a young pastor, they had to put a chain and a 50-pound weight on my leg just to slow me down because I just had this huge vision about everything, and, and it was exciting. And now that I'm older, I still have a vision. I thank God for that. But it's not like it used to be. I dream dreams about how it was and things that happened. And so the book of Joel is, is speaking of a future event when the Spirit of God be poured out upon all flesh. Because when you understand the Old Testament, in Old Testament time, the Spirit of God came upon a person for a particular situation and then withdrew himself. If you want to get a picture of what the Spirit of God is, you need to go back to the tabernacle. When Moses erected the tabernacle in the wilderness, in the center of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. And that is the place where God chose to come down and fill the Holy of Holies with His presence. And you remember it was so full, there wasn't room for hardly anybody in there, barely even the priest, to walk in. And you remember they had a bell, they had to keep ringing, he had a rope on his leg in case he fell dead. He went into that Holy of Holies and had to confess his sins and cleaned his life up. God would have struck him dead. But that picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the Spirit of God filling that is called the Shekinah glory of God. Are you ready for this? That same Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God, moved into your tabernacle, your life, the very moment you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. Amen. Isn't that amazing? I mean, all they could do is stand in awe and, and one person had the access, the high priest, and then when Jesus came, what happened? The temple was rent in half. And now the access to the Father is through His Son, Jesus. You and I have His Spirit. So the book of Joel is prophetic in meaning, 
futuristic in meaning and purpose. It's dealing with a different program, but it also has a ramification and application to the Spirit of God coming upon the church, which is the second program. So you've got the program with Israel, then you've got the program with the church. So let's move ahead and let's go to, that was Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And by the way, David, thank you for doing this because there's a ton of scripture today. And we're going to move very quickly. And so you can go back and listen to this. Thanks to Brother Keller. Take notes and everything and put them in your Bible because you will have an understanding today of the purpose, the ministry, and the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay? Let's fast forward to see what Jesus said. And by the way, Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. He's God incarnate, God in the flesh. So if you go to John chapter 14, and if you look at verse, 20, uh, verse 16, John 14, 16, this is the promise of the Spirit. The word Spirit is capitalized. The word is pneuma. We get the word pneumatology, which is the study of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. He says, and I will pray uh, to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, I want you to look at the word give. I specifically use a King James Version a lot because it translates out of the Greek language. And the words, really, when you do the etymology of a word and begin the study of a word, you get the depth and the meaning of a word, and it begins to kind of reveal more things. But I want you to look at the word give. Is salvation earned or given? It's given, isn't it? Is the Holy Spirit something is earned or it's given? Which one? It's given. And why do we hear some of this teaching from a theological realm that you have to do something to get this? Such as speaking an unlearned un un language, unknown language, speaking tongues. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Holy Spirit of God is a gift from God at the moment of salvation. The reason why it's a gift of God at the moment of salvation is because one of the ministries of the Spirit of God inside of us is bears witness with the Spirit of God in heaven and tells us that we're saved. Very simple. He says he will give you another, now notice what it says, comforter. The word comforter there is parakletos. It simply means a go beside. It simply means someone to come alongside of us. Someone to be with us. Someone to acknowledge us. Someone that will be there as an advocate. That's who he is. And where is he at today? He's not in the tabernacle in the wilderness. Where is he at? He's in the tabernacle in your life. This is the tabernacle. An earthing tabernacle. My house is the Spirit of God. I have no idea what happened. I'm broken. The battery? The battery. Could be the battery, yeah. It's okay. We're going to keep rocking and rolling. And then it says that he may abide with you. Now look at the words again. What does it say? Forever. Now then, look at your Bible. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to keep saying, look at your Bible, bring your Bible, bring your electronic device, because you need to see this. What does it say in here? When you study the Bible, pay attention to every single word. It's there for clarification and understanding what it says. And he shall do what? Abide with you how long? Okay, what happened in the Old Testament when the Spirit of God came upon Samson, for instance? Man, he could slay some Philistines hip and thigh, couldn't he? Amazing. What about the fellow that got the pea patch and just took care of business all by himself? The Spirit of God came upon them specific ministries, then left. That's not the case today. When I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, October 10, 1908, the Spirit of God came in to permanently take a dwelling place in my life. He began a ministry that I did not understand. He began working in my life in ways that only he could work. Because he understands who I am and how to work with me. We often have a big kick out of our daughters coming over talking about how different their children are. Well, we know this for a fact. If our youngest daughter had been born first, there would not have been any more of them. That's not true. We love our children. But... But we, we were listening to Candace the other day talking about how different Ava is and Abby. And they just, just I said, of course they are. That's because we are all wonderfully and magnificently made in the image of God, distinctly. Matter of fact, you only got the set of fingerprints that you've got. Nobody else in the world will ever have them. And God knows how to work with us. Brother, that is right on target. It ain't our job to change nobody. 
It's our job to tell them how much God loves them, and they'll stay in this book. He will do the work. He will change their life one step at a time. And so notice, this is really important teaching here because you have a lot of doctrine here that, that does not divide. Doctrine does never divide. Doctrine clarifies and solidifies. And when you're in a church where doctrine is not being preached, you're going to have a lot of division. And you may as well get used to it right now. I am a doctrinal preacher. Verbatim. That's how I was trained. That's how I grew up under preachers that taught the scripture exactly the way it was, dividing it the way it's supposed to be divided. It says, thus saith the word of God. That's just who I am. Amen. Too old to change. Everybody said, only. Oh, now notice this. He will abide with you forever. You can't run him off. But I know one thing you can do. You can grieve him. And you can put him in a compartment in your home, speaking of your tabernacle, and shut the door and not listen to him. It's not going to cause him to leave. Even the spirit, notice the word, is capitalized of truth. Now, the spirit is called many things. You do a study on the spirit of God in the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's called many things, the Holy Spirit. The right here is called the spirit of truth. God's Holy Spirit inside of us, get this, he will always lead you in truth. He will never lead us in falsehood. You say, how do I know it's the spirit of God? The Bible tells you to try the spirit. And if the Spirit confesses who Jesus is, He is Lord and God and Savior, then you're going to know it's coming from the right direction because it will always agree with this book. Yeah. I'll tell you what sends a red flag up. When someone stands up, pastor, lay worker in the church, and they begin to draw attention to themselves because something special in their life that the Spirit of God is doing and nobody else is getting it, brothers and sisters, you better get ready for a theological discussion with your preacher. Because God has given you everything that He's given me. I have no corner on the Holy Spirit and neither do you. Amen. It's right here. And when someone says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to prophesy that, let me tell you what prophecy is. It's telling what's already happened. Right out of this book. It's easy to prophesy for Brother Daniel. Brother Daniel, God's going to bless your life. It's right out of the book. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the God that come on. Nor sitteth in the seat of sinners or scorners. But God will bless you as you walk in his word. That's prophecy. But if someone stands up and says, I got a word from the Lord. You better be in here. Come on, brother. That sends a red flag up my sleeve. Not going to happen here. Amen, brother? Amen. We're going to make sure it's told the way it's supposed to be told. Then someone starts speaking in a language that only then perhaps God. Matter of fact, there's no such thing as an unknown language to God. Did you know that? He knows them all. Uh oh. Hold on. Let's keep on moving. Even the spirit of truth. Now notice this. Whom the world cannot receive. Remember what I told you about Joel? Joel said in the last days, the day of the Lord, the last time, you're talking prophetically, you're talking perhaps in the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ, Joel said he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. But here Jesus says, the world cannot get this. You know why you can understand things that the world cannot understand? When I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about those who are without Christ. You know why? Because the Spirit of God reveals to you what the truth is. You say, how can the world act so wicked? How can people be so off, off the wall and do things that are just totally just unacceptable at any time in any culture? How can they do that? They do not have the capacity to think the way God thinks. Because a natural man, person who is not saved, cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. It's impossible. But there's one thing the Spirit of God will do to all flesh. He will convict them of sin. That's why when you start preaching a message about sin, people start kind of crawling up, name it, claim it, get rid of it or else, and everybody fights you. You bother them. Whenever you preach the gospel, you're going to offend people. Maybe not intentionally, but the Spirit of God is going to convict people what is wrong. And He's going to convict people about how they need Jesus. You remember the day before you accepted Christ? Then the next day you got face to face with Jesus and you needed Christ. You just you felt in your heart, if I don't get saved, I may not live another minute. If I don't get saved, 
I may, may not never get saved. I've got to get saved today. That was the Spirit of God working in your life. Amen. <laughs> Somebody say an amen. amen. Cannot receive it because the world can't see it. It's amazing how the world has to see something to believe it. A lot of Christians are that way too. That's why we are walking by faith and not by sight. Sometimes it's hard. Isn't it? But if you're always looking for a sign, if you're always looking to see something, maybe that's not going to happen. God is going to reveal it to you through faith. Neither know of Him, but you know Him, for He dwells within you and shall be in you. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now that's the promise of Jesus. Isn't there a lot of rich stuff right there? Did you know all that was there? Amen? Amen. All right there. Eternal security just point blank. He'll never leave us. You'll never. I will never outsend the grace of God. It's impossible. I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. Amen. 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 And the Spirit of God resides in my heart. Now, I'm getting tired. So we looked at the promise. The promise from God, of the Holy Spirit, the promise from Jesus. Now let's talk about the pouring out to the church. Now follow me to the book of Acts. Now let me fast forward. Jesus, gone to Calvary, paid the ultimate price for the sins of the world, was buried in a rich man's tomb, and the Spirit of God, the Bible says, raised him the third day. Man, this guy right here, I love this brother. You got a straw that reached down there? <laughs> He's such a kind man. I don't even know where I was. Got thirsty. Okay. Now I'm pouring out on the church. Remember, how many programs are there in the Bible? You got two. You got the children of Israel. Future outpouring of the Spirit of God. Joel's talking about the day of the Lord. No doubt we're talking about future events. But we're talking about something that is applicable. It can be applied here. Because it happens on this particular day. There's a miracle. And listen, please. The Spirit of God will only draw attention to Jesus. Can I have an amen? amen. That's what concerns me when somebody tries to get attention for themselves using the Spirit of God. Wrong. The Spirit of God testifies of Jesus. He reveals Jesus. And that was the purpose. But here we have on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish holiday of all things. We have a Jewish Savior, by the way. Amen, Bill? His name is Jesus. In verse number 1, chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, there were people, Jewish people, from all over the regions of every dialect that you possibly could imagine there on this very important day to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Jerusalem was packed full of people. When it's fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. I bet you didn't know Honda started right here, did you? Don't get it in a minute. Anybody drive a Honda Accord? My pastor told me one time, don't tell that joke there. Okay, I'll never tell that joke again there. They're all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. This is miraculous. There appeared unto them, and here's the best way the author, who some think were Luke, was Luke here, could describe it. Clothing tongues of fire. You remember when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai? He was the only one up there, and God said, you better put a barrier around the back, about, about around the top of this mountain, and I'll tell everybody to cross that barrier. I'll kill them. Only Moses was allowed up there. And you remember what happened to Moses? There was so much fire and so much glory, it turned his hair like Bob Oval. <laughs> By the way, Bob has already agreed to play Santa Claus this year. You're going to grow that beard out some more. We love you, Bob and Susan. And Susan's precious mom. And Susan told me she keeps them all in line, too, by the way. Cloven tongues of fire and set upon each of them. Now, this could be the 120 that was in the other room. We're not for sure, but that's what we're going to assume. Now notice they were all filled with what? Now here's another word. Holy Ghost, Paracletos. Something you can't see. 
By the way, God is not to be equated to the man. I'm going to help you with your theology right now. Never say God and refer to him as the man upstairs. Can I have an amen? amen. God is a spirit. Now, I know we do that sometimes in respect. So I'm not getting on to you, but I'm teaching you something. He's a spirit. And he looks for those to worship him in spirit and truth. And he began to speak with other tongues. Lagos is the word here. As a spirit, notice the word capital spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, gave it utterance. And there were dwelling, here's your explanation. If you just keep reading scripture, scripture will define scripture. Scripture will always interpret Scripture. Here it goes. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. They were for Pentecost. Now, just in case we don't understand what he's talking about, it says, when there was noise aboard that the multitude came together, they were confounded because every man heard them speak in their own loss. You know what happened here this day? A miracle of God. Go back to the book of Genesis. In the Tower of Babel. What did God do that day? And by the way, the Holy Spirit was present and so was Jesus. Let us go down and let's see what these rascals are doing. And what happened? You had all these people speaking one language on the Tower of Babel, building this huge skyscraper to reach heaven so they could worship the stars or whatever in heaven and not God. And God said, I'll just fix them and struck them all with a key magic. Hand me a brick. God says, what? The languages were all confounded and confused. Because all the people got together and God saw what happens when everybody's able to communicate together. And you better pay attention to that because we're there again today. You can talk to whoever you want to talk to across the world in their language just with a computer device. We're there again. And he struck them all in different languages. You know what he did here on this day? So Jesus could be preached and glorified, he reversed the Tower of Babel. Can you say amen? Amen. And all of a sudden, Yeshua, everybody said, that's Jesus. And then the great message of Jesus was preached. Multitudes upon multitudes came to Jesus as a result of the filling of the church with the Holy Spirit. So if you wonder what one of the main purposes of the Spirit of God is in your life, is to glorify the Father in heaven and to help you reveal Jesus to other people. Glory to God. Now, we're going to finish this quickly. I'm going to rattle off the scriptures. You have to go get them later. So you have the plan for the church. The church is empowered and infused with the Holy Spirit. And he is here today because the church is here. Amen. Now the paracletos. What is his mission in his ministry in our life? You ready? He's a helper. He's a go beside. He's a comforter. John 14, 16. He's an intercessor, Romans 8, 26 through 27. It simply means you ever got to a place you didn't know what to pray? I just don't know what to pray. Here's what you do. Spirit of God inside of me, I love you. Help me pray the perfect will of God for this situation. And just bite your lip and listen to what God can do. He'll pray for you inside and help you pray. He's a teacher, John 14, 16. Thank God for preachers. Thank God for Bible teachers. But the greatest teacher you will ever have lives inside of you. His name's the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you've got a Bible, you sit there and open it, and God's Spirit will teach you the Word of God. Can I have an amen? amen. This brother's going to Panama. How many Bible college professors have been to Panama to teach these people? Not many. Just maybe a handful, but they had a Bible, didn't they? Man, I had a young man out in the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula never saw a Bible college a day in his life, had a King James Version Bible, Schofield, and he was right on the money doctor. How did that happen? God taught him the word as he read it. Don't let anybody ever fool you that you've got to have all these PhDs, DDDs, and all them CDRs, and all that stuff to learn the Bible. That is not true. You have the teacher inside of you, the Spirit of God. He's a leader. Galatians 5, number 16. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, guess what? You ought to be led by the Spirit. He's also a fruit, a fruit provider. How many of you like good cantaloupes from Pecos? Best cantaloupe, you know where you can get them right now? This is an advertiser for HEB. You ought to send your offer here. Walk in the front door of HEB, and there they are. Don, I think that thing weighed three pounds. We were going to buy two. We said, ain't no way you eat two of them cantaloupes. They're huge. But boy, if you have Pecos over there, get out of the way. 
We were over in Grapevine several weeks ago. I was playing over in Grapevine, and we went to a little farm. I think we paid $5 for one of them cantaloupes. And it was about this big. I thought, man, it's ridiculous. You ready for this two for three? H-E-B, two for three. That, okay, I expect money from H-E-B. This gets out there. We cut that puppy open. I'm going to tell you something. The kids come over and they ain't none of it left. We're going to have to go back and get another one. You better hurry because Pegasus cantaloupes are just about gone. I don't know where that came from. Fruit of the Spirit, whatever. I don't know if cantaloupes are fruit or not. It doesn't matter. Good stuff to me. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 26 talks about the fruit of the Spirit inside of us. Love, meekness, compassion, long-suffering, on and on it goes. Kindness, love, mercy. That's what God produces in our life. He's also a witness bearer. Romans 8, 16. Two things about the Spirit of God. i got three points. I'm going to be done in four and a half minutes. Let's I was preaching one day in church, and the guy said, you're not telling the truth. And I said, time to watch. And he did, and I was longer than what I was supposed to be, so <laughs> three and a half minutes. <laughs> Two things about the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4, 30. He can be grieved, or he can be guided to you. Which one? He simply cannot do both. At the same time. That's why it says, Grieve not the Spirit of God. How do we grieve Him? By acting contrary to who we are. By not acting as a Christian person, we identify with others that we are. By not being truthful, by loving other things more than God. We grieve the Spirit of God by foul communication. By the way, that, that, that uh, verse over Ephesians 4 talks about corrupt communication proceeding forth out of the mouth. And I think another passage in the Scripture says, you know what? Sweet water ought to bring sweet water. Sour water ought to bring sour water. Shouldn't bring both. Amen? Now that's my translation of that. But it's close. If we're grieving the Spirit of God, He will simply withdraw His guiding. He'll let us sit until we listen to him and discover what it is that he's trying to teach us to avoid. Kingston, Philadelphia. How many of you read the story? Oh, my Lord. The city of brotherly love. There's a whole area called Kingston that's the most lawless piece of property probably on planet Earth. It's made national news, now it's making world news. It's where you can go and do all the drugs that you want to do have all the needles provided, and no police officer is going to do anything for you buying it, shooting it, storing it, selling it, whatever. They're scooping people up off the sidewalk every day dead. Because 90% of the new drugs that are hitting the streets have what is called animal tranquilizer concoction in it, making them zombies, eating the flesh off their bodies. And I got to thinking to myself, how many of those people would like to be out of that situation? And the Spirit of God reminded me, Skip Pilgrim one time, you were stumbling, bumbling, drunk, snorting drugs, taking pills. And there you go, except for being my spirit who lives inside of you that led you out of that. Spirit of God is leading or grieving. Last thing. The Bible says to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, that means that we're empty of Him. No, he's, you've got all of Him that you're ever going to have. I was up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at a youth camp one time. It's a beautiful place. I preached there several times and got way back up into the mountain area. And before I knew there were wildcats and black bear, they didn't tell me that. <laughs> they told me I'd never gone that far, but I remember a rock. I could take you there today. We were in Albuquerque. Big old rock overlooking a beautiful valley. And I sit there and say, God, is there something I don't have? Are you listening to me? I said, is there something I'm missing? Do I need more of something that you have? And Spirit spoke to my heart. 
you got all of me that you'll ever need. But how much of you do I have? Make sense? You see, if I'm filled, that simply means I'm full of the Spirit of God. He is leading, controlling, guiding, and helping me be an example to other people that I should be. But what about being foolish? You know, there's a church, and we'll close with this. I told you, watch your watch. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians. There was a church that was foolish about this matter. Because I might be speaking to somebody today, you just don't know what it is for the Spirit of God to get hold of your life. I mean, just turn you upside down. Move you in a direction. What do you think happened the day I come home and told Donna we was going to surrender to the ministry? I was playing steel guitar at Billy Bob's. Driving a Dr. Pepper truck here today. Had a house, two new cars, two little girls. I said, we're selling everything we got. We're going to Bible college. She said, when are we leaving? <laughs> it's because God works that way. It's like coming here. When are we going? That's how God works. Amen? So Paul writes to this church, church, who was supposed to be what? Filled? Come on. This church supposed to be filled in Corinthians? Right? This church. Believers. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which you have of God? And you are not your finishing. Somebody finish it. You don't belong to you. You and I will never understand what it means to have the Spirit of God get a hold of our life and pull a fill it. Direct you and lead you to places you never thought you would ever go and do things you'd ever do until you step out of your life and give it to God. It's just like my money, my car, my house. I beg you difference in 50 years, everybody in this room, everything you have will have somebody else's name on it. Mark that down in 50 years, including Donna. Not yours. Lost to God. There's nothing more exciting than stepping out of your own situation and saying, God, it's not my life. It's yours. Church at Corinth didn't do that. They were as worldly as they possibly could be. Getting drunk at the Lord's communion, looking down their noses at other people, talking about people. People in the church were committing fornication. You know the difference between adultery and fornication. I don't have to teach y'all. We're all older, older people. And nobody was going to say anything about it. Well, go ahead. After all, it's that kind of time right there. Shack up time's always been around. But you see what happens? We become foolish. And when we act foolish, what's the results of acting foolish? It's like being on top of the roof, nailing shingles the old-fashioned way, and you look away at the same time you draw the hammer back. Pop! And you say, how stupid could I have been? I should have kept my eyes on the nail. <laughs> Folks, that's who the Holy Spirit is. And He loves you. He's inside of you. He's inside of me. And he has an exciting life for you. And he's just waiting for you to say, here it is. Take it. Use it for your glory. God bless you for being here today.